All right. So hello out there. Don't see you. This is uh, Natalie Mella speaking. Um, we're just here on time. It's one minute after one. So I think I'll just then slowly begin the process of, of introducing this event. Um, I can see the numbers of participants have gone up to, you know, there people are coming in as I speak. So um, welcome. Uh, to all of you who are who are joining us, as as you can see from the poster, this is a webinar on health inequality and pandemic, sponsored by the Institute for Comparative Modernities and the Poulston Institute. My name is uh, Natalie Melas, and I'm the resident director of the Institute for Comparative Modernity. And uh, Fouad Mackey, whom you might see just below my image, but who knows where you're actually seeing him, um, is the co-host. He is the director of uh, the Polson Institute um, and a member of the Department of Global Development in the College of Agriculture and Life, Life Sciences. I would also like to thank Ashley Stockstill, uh, the event manager for, I, for ICM, for her, for her big efforts uh, in facilitating this event and, and, and other adaptations um, to the current crisis. Um, before beginning in, in earnest, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, that this event, like all events at Cornell University, is play, taking place, however dispersed we feel, on Cayuga lands. Um, so we want to acknowledge uh, the, the history of colonialism that uh, we are in fact benefiting from. Our colleague um, Eric Schaefitz has alerted us that the theft of indigenous lands in several other states, many other states in fact, has contributed also to the funding of this land grant institution. So we'll note that as well. Um, so thank you all, first of all, for overcoming, for all 43 of you so far. Um, whatever Zoom exhaustion you may be feeling to join us this afternoon. Uh, we initiated this webinar with a strong conviction that this crisis for all of the, the strange new digital virtual waters into which it is leading us is also an opportunity to experiment with collaborative intellectual endeavors and for intellectual work to enter with and engage in different kinds of public spaces. So this is the very first attempt to, to, to try and do that. Uh, let me just say a few words about the two institutes uh, um, that are co-sponsoring this, and then I'll speak a little bit about the format, and then I'll hand it over to uh, my colleague, Fouad Mackey, who will introduce our distinguished speakers. Um, the Institute for Comparative Modernities and the Arts and Sciences College supports interdisciplinary research workshops and events relating to the transnational scope of the modern in its multifarious engagement over centuries with capitalism, colonialism, and it follows their ramifications into the present. The Poulton Institute for Global Development is housed in the Department of Global Development in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and supports projects and working groups that address issues ranging from economic inequality to discursive politics, contributing to Cornell's leadership in global development. So our format this afternoon uh, will be the following. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, beginning with a short account of the recent books they have published germane to the topic today, and then following with their reflections relating to the current pandemic. We will then solicit your questions in the Q&A function. So I just want you to note at the bottom of your screen on the very right, there is the Q&A function. Please write your questions there. Um, we'll take about three questions at a time and, and allow our speakers to respond to them. I would note that the chat function is also open. So if you have comments or there are discussions you want to enter into with, with other people attending, that would be the place to do it. The questions will be in the Q&A section at the bottom uh, right of your screen. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Fouad Mackey, who is currently director of the Polton Institute, uh, the co-sponsor of this webinar and he will introduce our speakers. Go ahead. Unmute, you need to unmute. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, just before we proceed, I noticed that Jamila is having difficulty um, coming online. There she is, okay, good. Um, thank you again, Natalie. Um, my name is Fouad Mackey. As Natalie said, I'm in the Department of Global Development. I'm currently 
director of the Poston Institute for Global Development. And uh, it's a real pleasure and a delight to invite this, uh, to have these two distinguished panelists with us today. I'll uh, briefly introduce them so that we can move on to the uh, conversation and discussion uh, as soon as possible. Um, so Jamila Michner is a professor in the Department of Government at Cornell. Her research focuses on the interrelationships between poverty, racial inequality, and public policy in the United States, a subject she uh, has most recently explored in a book entitled Fragmented Democracy, Medicaid, Federalism, and Unequal Politics, just published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. Uh, the book assesses American political life from the vantage points of those disproportionately Black and Latino communities who are living in or near poverty and are reliant on a federated government for the provision of vital resources. It critically examines how Medicaid affects democratic citizenship and how federalism transforms Medicaid beneficiaries' perception of government and structures their participation in politics. Fragmented Democracy won the 2019 Virginia Gray Best Book Award and was also a finalist for the 2019 Prose Awards, which annually recognizes the, ver the very best of professional and scholarly publishing. Suman Seth is a Marie Underhill Knoll Professor of the History of Science uh, in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell. He works on social, cultural, and intellectual history of science and medicine, including the history of medicine, race, and colonialism, the physical sciences, particularly in quantum theory, and gender and science. Suman is the author of Difference and Disease, Medicine, Race, and Locality in the 18th Century British Empire, again published by Cambridge University Press in 2018 and also Crafting the Quantum, Arnold Sommerfeld and the Practice of Theory, 1890 to, 20, uh, to 1926. Okay, maybe I'll leave it at that, very brief uh, introduction. And uh, without further ado, uh, allow the panelists to start. I don't know how you wanted to do that, uh, Natalie. We'll begin with Jamila. Are you ready, Jamila? I am, if I can share my screen. Oh, okay, I can, great. Hopefully that works out. Um, can everybody see my, my shared screen here? Yes. Okay, great. I always like to make sure. Okay, so um, thanks to everyone who is logging on to this panel. I know that Zoom exhaustion is a real thing. Uh, and so it's great to, that we're still willing to engage together this way and to think together about the problems that are facing us now and, and have long faced us, but are coming into really sharp relief in this moment that we're in. Uh, so the, the topic for today is inequality and pandemics, but we've been prompted to begin with a few, um, a few words on our recently published book. So I will say that as a way of uh, explaining why I'm talking about my book. Uh, even though it's not about pandemics. And I, I think that uh, really what introducing the book uh, serves as a function, fun it functions um, to sort of give you a sense of the perspective that I bring to the conversation that we're having today, um, which is only one perspective and which I'm looking forward to sort of having complemented and supplemented by the other perspectives that will be a part of this conversation. But one of the things that I pay a lot of attention to in fragmented democracy is what it means to experience a, a, an important um, healthcare program from the vantage point of people who are at the economic and racial margins of the polity and embedded in a larger political structure that is marked by deep fragmentation, right? And that fragmentation in a kind of formal institutional sense in the US is undergirded by federalism, which is something that we normally think of perhaps in institutional terms or with respect to a kind of, you know, the structure of a polity in sort of large macro terms. And, and one of the things that I do in the book is I, t I take this kind of, this uh, concept that is usually we're oriented towards in macro terms 
and think about it from a micro perspective. What does it mean for people to rely on the state for one of their most acute needs and for people who are among the most vulnerable in our polity um, when the state itself is structured in a way that undergirds fragmentation? And, what, and, and I find a lot of things, and I won't go into it all because we don't have enough time, um, but what I find is that in a polity that's already deeply unequal um, and, and where the inequality is, is baked into uh, the, the actual institutional structure of the polity through federalism, which is not sort of neutral, which has implications for, for example, racial domination and inequality and has implications for uh, poverty and, and, and economic inequalities. So when, uh, you know, a, a, a polity is structured in that way, um, what happens is that inequalities are, are exacerbated and they're exacerbated um, through institutional channels, even when a program itself is meant uh, to provide them with a crucial resource, which in this case is healthcare. So all of that is to say that I come to this topic thinking a lot about race, thinking a lot about poverty, thinking about policy, um, and thinking about larger institutional structures and how all of those operate within those structures. So maybe I'll sort of take that lens and now switch it so that we can think some, and I, I won't go on for too long, about the pandemic that we're currently in the midst of. One of the things that I've been saying again and again, and I feel like I'm on repeat with this, but you almost can't say it enough, um, is that the disparities that we're seeing um, with respect to COVID-19 are not surprising at all, and they're not new. And in fact, it would be difficult for me to imagine any other way for a pandemic to operate besides to exacerbate pre-existing inequalities. And in a polity that prior to a pandemic was more equal, then during a pandemic, we might see fewer disparities. But in a polity like ours, that prior to the pandemic was deeply unequal with respect to economic, political, and social status, and particularly along the lines of race, class, and geography, then what we should expect, right, is for any kind of a crisis to heighten and exacerbate these pre-existing inequalities. Um, and so, we, we understand that these, once we understand the, the extent of these pre-existing inequalities, it helps us to get a sense of what to look for and to pay attention to as we're trying to understand uh, the havoc that the pandemic wreaks. And in particular, with respect to health, wealth, and, and geography, I'll, I'll show a few slides that focus on those aspects of disparities. They're not the only one, there are many more. And of course, it's important, even though we're not in the post-pandemic phase yet, to recognize that the pre-existing inequality that led to heightened disparities during the pandemic is not going to stop there. And that there are implications for the post-pandemic realities in terms of recovering, uh, who recovers most quickly, who's able to bounce back to sort of pre-COVID-19 status in life and who isn't, and respect with respect to who is going to experience um, the most acute loss and trauma uh, during this period and what the implications of that will be. Um, so just a little bit on the pre-pandemic health disparities, I won't go through this in too much detail, but the point here is that for, for nearly every metric that we can think of, so this graphic shows, focuses on asthma, diabetes, heart disease, we can add to this, right? Um, but for nearly every metric that we can imagine, there are differences with respect to um, racial, racial and ethnic groups, which is the example that I'm using here, Although we would also see differences if I showed you a similar graphic that was based on income or wealth distributions um, in terms of pre-existing health disparities, right? Now, often I wanna flag that this is a kind of explanation that people I think use a little bit too comfortably, like, oh, well, the reason we're seeing disparities now are because there were disparities before, uh, sure. <laughs> but that opens up more questions than it closes, right? Why were there disparities before and what are the root of them? This doesn't explain uh, disparities with respect to COVID-19. Um, it, instead, it urges us to think critically about them and what their sources are. Beyond health disparities, there were in, inequities in, in just access to care, right? And this is part of what I study in studying public policy. But if we think about 
the states that expanded Medicaid, those are those states outlined in red here. Um, and then we, we look, at, look at that and think about it in relation to the proportion of uh, the state population that is, that is black, for example. We can see in the states that have um, the kind of the most, uh, uh, the highest number of, of black Americans are also many of those states are places where we didn't see expansion. So prior to uh, COVID-19, there were these intersections between policy and access uh, and race, for example, uh, that, that now are, of course, contributing to the disparities uh, that we see. Um, similarly, this is around access to care, even beyond the, the, the Medicaid program specifically, just in terms of barriers uh, that prevent people um, from being able to, or being willing to access care when they need it, right? Um, and it's easy if you're in a position where this isn't something that you think about, where anytime you have to go to the doctor, you just go. Uh, to underestimate the number of people who truly do not have that freedom, right, to, to, to seek the care they need, even in a country where that care should be widely available. Um, and then, of course, there are differences uh, prior to the pandemic. There were differences with respect to economic inequality. This is actually uh, poverty rates across racial groups um, as of 2018, right? And we can see, for example, that that Black Americans and, um, and Hispanic Americans have significantly higher poverty rates. All of this, of course, it's worth pointing out and I think important as our conversation goes forward to know is a function of institutions, right? Not individuals who make bad choices about their behavior, their health behaviors, or their lifestyles, or what have you. Sure, individuals do make bad choices about those things, but that is not limited to people who are economically or racially marginalized, right? The reasons why we see the inequalities take on the contours that they do is because of institutions. What kinds of institutions? All sorts, right? If we think about neighborhoods um, and housing and the, the deep levels of um, res racial and economic residential segregation that we have in this country, and there's lots of research to suggest that that contributes to health disparities. If we think about hospitals, um, there's no shortage of research that shows the various ways that bias operates, both in terms of the actual practices of um, physicians and other health practitioners in hospital, and in terms of the algorithms that hospitals use to determine need and to determine access to programs and treatments and so on and so forth. Um, if we think about workplaces, why are some, you know, are African Americans and Latinos disproportionately concentrated in occupations that put them on the front lines of this, of exposure to this virus? That is not coincidental. Um, if we think about prisons, which are hotspots for the outbreak of this virus and are also disproportionately and overwhelmingly inhabited by people of color and people living in poverty. These are institutions and just a few that have been perpetuating inequalities that are now um, at the sort of locus of the differences that we're seeing in terms of uh, disparities with respect to COVID-19. And those disparities are striking, right? I won't go over this in too much detail, but I did want to point out one specific um, uh, statistic that I heard recently that was really striking to me. This is as of May 11th, so it's actually outdated now. Um, on May 11th, if the rates of death uh, for COVID-19 had been equivalent across races, we would have seen 10,500 more Black people alive. We would have seen 1,400 more Latino people alive, and we would have seen 300 more Asian people alive. And so it's worth pointing out that we can look at graphics and charts like this, and we can see that it, that it appears that there are disparities, but really what this amounts to is actual human lives. People who have fathers and mothers and daughters and sisters and families who are gone, who would not have been were it not for racial inequality. Um, and then, of course, I'll just mention in closing here um, that the, the, the virus itself is exhibiting a vast range of inequalities, but the state response to the virus is also inequitable in various ways. One of the primary ways I'll point out is just geographically. It's just that different states are doing different things, which means your ability to, um, as, as a person, for example, who is living in poverty or who has lost your job, 
your ability to, to survive and to be able to have the resources that you need to, uh, to fare during this pandemic is gonna vary based on what state that you live in. Your ability to access healthcare is gonna vary based on what state that you live in. And even when states pass policy, they're variable in their implementation of it. So plenty of states and localities have said, we won't evict people from their homes at this time. And what we're finding um, is that implementation of this is variable. And there are states where people are being evicted and there's no enforcement. And so your exposure to vulnerability, not just in terms of your health, but in terms of your ability to have a roof over your head, in terms of your ability to have access to healthcare and many, many other things um, is variable based on not just race and class, but also where you live. Um, during this pandemic. And that is a feature also of institutions and of public policy. And I'll end with saying that, you know, I, I want us to remember, even as we have this conversation about health, health inequality, I'm a political scientist. So I'm always thinking about the political underpinnings of that inequality. And I've been struck by how racial and economic divisions are actually uh, undergirding our very responses to this pandemic so that we, we can't sort of stand outside of the inequalities and make decisions that make the most sense from a public health perspective. It's not an option for us. We're, we're so sort of deeply, um, these inequalities are so constitutive of our politics um, that they're actually driving and shaping it. And who's concerned about the co coronavirus, who's worried about contracting it, who's most on the front lines, all of these things are shaped by race and class, and so there's no way out of inequality, not with respect to who's suffering and not with respect to the solutions um, that, that we're attempting uh, to fashion in response to that suffering. I'll stop there. And I'll stop sharing my screen and let, okay. So Suman, would you like to take it from there? Um, sure, that was amazing, Jamila. So <laughs> I apologize in advance for what will follow. Um, so I want to begin by, actually, let me begin by thanking Fouad and Natalie, uh, first and foremost, for the invitation. And thank you guys for, um, for turning up. Uh, I note this every time that I can, but whether she likes it or not, Natalie remains um, a mentor to me. So it's always nice to mention that. Um, so uh, as instruction, I want to briefly summarize my book about medicine and race in the 18th century British Empire. And then I want to get into some of the questions that were sent ahead to us. I guess I'll have to summarize the questions and give my answers as well. Uh, and I think those questions are great. Um, so my book. The easiest way into my book is to ask a question that was asked a lot in the 18th century. Imagine you're traveling from, say, London to D Barbados. Two questions. Why, when you get there, are you likely to get horribly ill? And why, if you survive that illness, will you likely never get that sick again? And the answer that they gave is that you needed to become seasoned to the climate. Uh, think here not so much about food seasonings, nice, interesting kinds of food that can be kept out of season to liven up dreary winter fare, but about seasoned wood or seasoned metal. Uh, think about the fact that you've had to probably season your cast iron pan, or if you're from the Commonwealth like me, that you had to find linseed oil as a child to season your cricket bat you needed to season uh, people to their new environments as well. So seasoning was my way into the project and serves as a kind of thread throughout the book, which falls into three sections. The first looks at the fact that seasoning is a disease or illness of place. You get sick by moving from the place to which you're already habituated to a completely new place. And the bigger the difference in your environment, hence going from London to Barbados, the bigger the difference in your environs, the sicker that you'll get. So the first part of the book looks at 18th century understandings of the relationships between places and illnesses and the ways that that changed or not as medical men in say the West Indies grappled with slavery and empire. The second section of the book looks at empire specifically. How did thinking about seasoning shape what Edward Said calls the imaginative geography of empire? What did empire look like framed through the lens of illness? And in another chapter, 
how did the empire strike back? How did conceptions of illness conceived in the periphery come to shape ideas in the metropole? The final and largest section looks at race. Now, it should be noted that seasoning isn't actually about race. It's about nativity and habituation. Uh, black slaves in the early 18th century, it was observed, did get different diseases to white people. But according to medical men at the time, it was largely because they were slaves, lived in terrible conditions, had to eat terrible food, were judged to have terrible cultural practices, and not because they were black. The logic of seasoning suggested that anyone could become seasoned, and once they were, it grouped uh, white people and white Creoles and black Creoles seasoned together as against newly arrived white people and newly arrived black people. But the book does explore some new logics that one finds towards the end of the 18th century, where what we would call biological race begins to emerge and begins to shape medical practice where it was assumed that black bodies worked differently to white bodies in an essential and not merely acquired way. Now, I'll talk more about this if people are interested, but this new discourse emerged along with other more racialist ideas in response to the abolitionist movement and was centered on black skin in particular and on the question of whether black bodies naturally function better in the grueling heat and conditions of sugar plantations, so that it was not a curse by this argument on them to have to do what white people would not and by this argument could not do. So that's a summary of the book about the 18th century, as I say. Um, let me get on to some of the questions that um, we got sent. So the first one was, uh, what surprised us panelists the most? Uh, about what was going on with the pandemic. And we, part of Jamila's answer is not nearly enough, unfortunately. Um, for me, watching it as somebody who doesn't study this in the present day, one of the most interesting things has been this phenomenon of self-quarantining. Uh, that self-disciplining self and the moral pressure that has come with it. Now, it's not like this is entirely surprised, but it's an expansion of something that we'd seen before. One of the things I've been interested in for a long time is the relationship between power and knowledge in relation to public health. I find it frustrating when people simply name the power knowledge binary but don't pull it apart because what's most interesting is to look at the specifics. What particular forms of medical knowledge go with particular forms of state power? So the example that I've given in the past has to do with Foucault's classic discussion in Discipline and Punish and elsewhere of the shift from sovereignty to biopower or governmentality and the kinds of disciplinary power that accompany that latter shift, the world that we're in. So in the first part of the 19th century, the dominant form of explanation among British medical men in India for large scale epidemics was essentially miasmatic. The idea was that the emanations from dark, swamp, damp, swampy ground made people in its environs ill. So in order to deal with such outbreaks at a large scale, you had to control space, just as politically a sovereign's interest was in territory. With the development of the germ theory from the 1860s, that idea of merely controlling space no longer made sense. Now it's germs that made you ill and people who spread germs from place to place. You had to go, in other words, from policing space to policing people. Now you recognize the logic of a disciplinary regime immediately, but now add an extra element to that, which comes with the typhoid outbreaks of the early 20th century. What made Mary Malone, now known as Typhoid Mary, so frightening is that she was a case of something that had never ever been known before. She was an asymptomatic carrier. And to police against people who might make you sick, but who have zero symptoms, requires a ceaseless vigilance on the bodies of every single member of the population. We might now think of our current regime as the apotheosis of a disciplinary system. 
we are ceaselessly disciplined, ceaselessly, ideally, discipline ourselves and react with a level of outrage to anyone who does not engage in the same form of self-disciplining. Now, trust me, I believe that these lockdowns are the right thing to do, but I desperately wish Foucault were alive to see what is happening right now and to help us talk through it. A second question had to do with uh, kind of memory and forgetting. I think it began with the idea that for many people, uh, the idea that there was a pandemic that killed an enormous number of people almost exactly 100 years ago, the Spanish influenza outbreak after World War I, is a kind of novelty. And so the question was about, you know, why do we talk so little about pandemics? Why have we forgotten about them? Is this because we don't want to give agency to diseases? What's going on there? Um, and I will say that I think as a medical historian, I'm a little resistant to that question. Not because I don't think we forget. I think we forget all the time. This is, this is the curse of being a historian, is reminding people of this kind of thing. But I actually think that a lot of agency has been given to former outbreaks. We have arguments, for example, that suggest that the Black Death of 1347 to 48 was the thing that broke Europe out of the medieval stupor that it had found itself in and that therefore led to the Renaissance and ultimately the Industrial Revolution. We have arguments about the effect of the cholera outbreak in the US in the mid 1860s and its effect on a population returning from the Civil War, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. In my field, the danger can be about giving too much autonomous force to bacterial agents without adequate attention to social context. Think of Jared Diamond's best-selling Guns, Germs and Steel if you want an example. But what I do find fascinating are what gets remembered and when it gets remembered. It's worth noting, for example, that we see an absolute efflorescence of research on former epidemics when we're in one. So a massive spike in research on the Black Death during the AIDS crisis of the 1980s and 1990s. Also in the same period and for the same reason, new work on Typhoid Mary, new work on syphilis and new work on other diseases. So I see academics who people often ignore, say historians of 18th century medicine, getting asked to weigh in on stuff right now. And it'll be interesting to see what work emerges from the fact that in times of crisis, what I always think of as the narcissism of the present gets shaken a little bit and people realize that talking to historians might be worth something. I mean, to quote the president, what do you have to lose? Um, and then the third question had to do with statistics. It was super interesting to get and, and of course fascinating and, and meaningful to get uh, Jamila's uh, analysis in terms of statistics. But one of the questions we got was about the form of this argumentation and whether you know, there should be some kind of concern about it, whether we should talk about the way arguments now get made in this form. And I will just note that me medical statistics are my current obsession. It is indeed now, common, very common, to speak in terms of statistics, a word we should always remember, coined in the mid 18th century from the word for state. Statistics were things that statists needed to understand in order to govern states. I'm particularly interested in the mapping between the military, medicine and race because it's after around 1815 that we start seeing the kinds of claims that are now common namely that certain races are immune to or susceptible to certain diseases. It's now commonly put in genetic terms. Not because, and this would be the 18th century argument, not because they become habituated or seasoned to certain diseases or places, but because they're innately different, that there are racial differences in disease susceptibility. In other words, statistical differences about disease susceptibilities became part of the way that race in the 19th century became real and came to have real world effects. So in amongst all the statistics about the ways that say certain African American communities are particularly harshly affected by COVID-19, I'm also worried about what I am sure 
will be accompanying claims by some. We have suggestions that young people are much less susceptible to the disease and are worried that we will soon see arguments that ignore socioeconomic status and history to start making essentialist arguments about innate or biological weakness or susceptibility to disease. Historians, of course, suck at predicting things, but having the past to mine for awfulness means that we do worry a lot about potential things that could occur. So on that worry, I will stop. Thank you so much, this is great. Both of you, these are incredibly interesting. I'm amazed what you packed into this short format. It's fantastic. So uh, we're open for questions. Some questions have already come in. Again, uh, you can write comments in the chat function, but please write your questions in the Q&A because otherwise it's, it's too, too much to pay attention to all at once. Um, all right, so I'm gonna try to take up, I see one question right now. Are there more than that? Is everybody managing? Let, let, let me just read out this question and then we'll just, if you could just take them in order, Jamila and then, and then Suman. Um, this is a question from um, Jocelyn Vega. Uh, well, for, a question actually for Suman, so we'll uh, pose it to you. Professor Seif, seasoning in your context is an outcome of processes that you mentioned, if I'm following. Uh, my question for you is how are these processes possibly connected? Um, with Professor Michener's presentation on institutionally embedded inequalities. Right. And both presentations sort of merge together for, for our questioner. Yeah, well, I think that this is a fantastic question and it actually gets at the kind of shift over time that um, I'm particularly interested in. In the early 18th century, medical practitioners would absolutely have combined institutional factors with uh, differences of place, differences of age, differences of gender, and so on and so forth. Um, so this goes back to Hippocrates's fourth century BC text, Airs, Waters and Places, where he also talks about political systems as shaping uh, people's personalities and all kinds of stuff. So all of those would be factors for an early 18th century medical practitioner to take into account to understand why, for example, slaves in an institution of slavery should indeed be expected to get different diseases than uh, a wealthier person who was free. All of those would be legit forms of explanation. What's fascinating is that by the latter 19th century, most of those things or a lot of those things get factored out or ignored in favor of a much more binary set of explanations in terms of race, which says that regardless of particular, say, institutional factors or whatever, it's the blackness of a black slave that leads to certain illnesses rather than their slave status. So to summarize, the answer I would give is that it changes over time. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, if I could just add very quickly, I, 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 I love being on a panel with Professor Seth. It's not our first time and every time I learn a lot, um, but one of the way, in terms of sort of points of um, connection between uh, all that we learned from him and some of what I said, uh, I think it, it, there's a little bit of sort of, I think, helpful pushing uh, in terms of um, how to think about the various statistics that are emerging around COVID-19. And I'm always a bit torn, especially when I present racial statistics or statistics broken down by race, which I do all the time because I understand that there's a bunch more underlying that and that the actual sort of crux of the problem isn't race and instead uh, race is a proxy for a lot of other things that, that actually are part of constructing race as we know it and understand it, right? Um, which is one of the reasons why I try not to ever give a presentation of, uh, that includes sort of statistics broken down by race but doesn't talk about institutions and the various kind of mechanisms for race being a kind of channel uh, for producing inequality, right? Um, because short of inclusion of a conversation about institutions and mechanisms, I think folks who, who otherwise don't know how to interpret those numbers 
can come away with interpretations that are that are sort of based on um, principles of racial essentialism. And even sort of ordinary people have those interpretations. When this uh, first started, several of my family members said, well, it doesn't look like any black people are getting it. I think we're fine. Um, and I kept telling them that's not how that works, <laughs> you know? And so th these are really uh, the, the idea that, that, that there are some sort of inherent differences that either make particularly, particular racial groups more vulnerable or less are both very dangerous, dangerous in different ways, um, but, but very dangerous nonetheless. And so how we talk about these things is really crucial and something that I'm continually struggling with. All right, so I've got two more questions. I'm gonna pose those. Everybody can read them too, but I guess I'm still mimicking our, what we're used to. So the first is from Manuel Berduc for both of you. Um, how do the theoretical assumptions we have about germs, viruses, quote, uh, parentheses, invisible enemies, affect the ways in which politicians react or do not react, right? Theoretical assumptions about them. How do, how does, in other words, how is the violence we're seeing, relate, how does it relate to problems of how we approach this, the issue of the virus in the first place? So that's one question. I'll read the second one from Leslie Adelson, um, who thanks you uh, for these great presentations and asks, given the emphasis in the talks on populations encompassed by either federalism or empire, how would you encourage us to think about refugees in analyzing the nexus of pandemic medicine, governance, and inequality? Thank you. So uh, Jamila, do you wanna start? I'm assuming. Yeah, um, I'll start with the first question and then I'll stop and, and we can sort of go back and forth. That might be easier. Uh, this is a great question and one that I confess I haven't thought about too much, um, but this notion as of germs as sort of invisible enemies, um, one of the things that I have been thinking about, not necessarily in terms of uh, politicians, but in terms of other kinds of agents of the state, is that there's a way in which um, you know, the virus as sort of uh, an enemy that, that we can't see, uh, but that we know can hurt us and we should fear can sort of be superimposed on groups that we already feel fearful of, right? And so part of what I'm thinking about here are examples, for, uh, for instance, of, um, of policing and how police in places like Chicago and St. Louis um, are sort of, you know, differentially reacting to people breaking the rules around social distancing. And I think it was last week that the NYPD uh, released some of its data on, you know, who is getting cited and arrested for violating social distances, distancing rules. And in the borough of Brooklyn, it was something like, you know, the vast majority of people um, who were being cited and arrested were, were African American, even though, you know, various people on Twitter were posting pictures of, of white people in Brooklyn, like this close to each other in parks, um, and police sort of hanging around doing nothing. And so there's this idea that th this virus is an enemy and it's a quote unquote foreign enemy. It's an other in many ways that's dangerous. There are other others that we already know are dangerous. So there's a way in which these, um, th that fear can kind of coalesce and, and now sort of um, racial others or even some of the policing of homeless people, right? Uh, economic others can get further marginalized and alienated and punished because of the sort of additional leverage that this scary enemy virus provides the state for operating in, in particular in marginalized communities. So I think that was sort of my, my thought in relation to that question. I don't know if it was an answer. <laughs> Um, I think that's a great answer, and it's pretty much exactly where um, I was thinking to go to. I mean, one thing I should note, again, it's the, it's the 18th century historian in me, but most of the diseases that I study in the 18th century, people don't think they're contagious, right? Contagion is actually a really new kind of thing. They know that smallpox is contagious. There's a small number of diseases, but for the most part, people blame their environment, airs, waters, and places, for the fact that people get sick at around the same time. And my favorite analogy, someone says, um, look, if you and I both go and walk out in the rain and we both get wet, it's not because I got you wet, 
it's because we're in an environment, right? So that's the explanation. So it is interesting for me to now grapple with a world where everything is obsessed with contagion, right? Uh, but that's not inevitable. But yes, to get to the point, of course, there, there's this powerful metaphorical connection between viruses and bacteria, which are foreign agents that are destroying the body from within. And, and of course, the kinds of people who are then metaphorically related to such viruses, Jews within Nazi Germany, getting quickly to the next question, refugees, exactly, Leslie, 100%. And then a very powerful, and this has been happening since at least the late 19th and early 20th century, very explicitly arguments about refugees bringing illnesses so that the metaphor, in a sense, gets collapsed on itself so that the refugee and the disease are one and the same and they're destroying the state from within. Um, I think there was a question in there about what we do about that. I mean, change the state. I, 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 I don't know, teach, at the very least, teach people that these are incredibly potent metaphors that people have reached for over and over again, and they have been heinous every single time. Yeah, and let me add that this question on refugees, uh, you know, I really appreciate this. It's, it's apparent to me from the questions what a sort of interdisciplinary and broad thinking audience this is. And I love that because it always pushes me and in many ways challenges me. I think this question challenges me and for two reasons. Um, one is because I haven't thought much about it, um, which as soon as I read the question, I, I, I thought to myself, how shameful that I haven't thought much about this and it, instructive itself, right? Um, but, but secondly, because I often think I spend a lot of time thinking about the the inequities that a, a kind of institutional structure like federalism can breed, right? And that's about you know which kind of sub-state units you're a part of or not a part of, and how that seems like a pretty arbitrary metric for deciding whether you should have access to something um, that is sort of a core part of just your basic human dignity, right? So whether I should have access to Healthcare depends on whether I live in Mississippi or Minnesota. Part of the impetus for my book was how arbitrary and unfair and inhumane that, that, uh, that strikes me as, right? And, and if you think about, for me, when I think about uh, refugees, it's sort of a, a larger kind of meta version of that because the, the arbitrariness of sub-state boundaries um, is, is no arbitrary with respect to kind of like a kind of moral center, right? Um, is no different in many ways than the arbitrariness of, of nation state boundaries or other kinds of boundaries. And so uh, where, where are people left when they don't fall neatly within those boundaries and they don't have uh, states upon which to call for, um, for resources or for help is, is a really difficult question. And I think fundamentally, um, it, it's a moral question that perhaps the fact that I hadn't thought about it much before this suggests uh, that it's a moral question that isn't uh, sufficiently uh, confronted. Thank you very much. These are, this is, yes, a powerful, very difficult, right? When you open it on beyond the state, beyond the nation state, uh, how to even think about that inequality, how to formulate it. A really very eloquent, moving answer. I'm gonna hand it over to Fouad to pick up the next questions. Okay. Someone, did you want to say something in re response to uh, Leslie's question? I mean, I spoke briefly to it. Um, I mean, I can't really speak with any expertise okay. to questions about federalism and so on. Yeah, I could, you know, I could talk more about the movements of populations. I can note, for example, that in trying to explain why yellow fever numbers had exploded in the West Indies in, say, the middle of the 18th century, um, one of the techniques that physicians used was to suggest that it was slaves themselves who were bringing the disease from Africa, where it was known to be, to the West Indies. So it's a very old move. Um, and it's worth noting that it was done yet again to a population that was suffering in enormous numbers. So the other place that seasoning comes up is in discussions about deaths of slaves. So 
the standard kind of number that was given is somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of enslaved peoples who arrived in the West Indies died in the first three years, died in what was called the seasoning. Uh, and this was then written into economic logic so that a seasoned slave was worth 30 to 50% more than an unseasoned seasoned slave, so that capitalism and medicine went hand in hand. But it's well worth noting the way that then that blame for their own deaths was put at the hands of people moved against their will to be enslaved workers somewhere else. So again, we can see the patterns flowing across centuries um, and not unfortunately changing as much as we'd like them to. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question is from August uh, Hutton uh, and it goes uh, like this. Re recognizing that these institutional structures we are discussing are often difficult to quantify, do either of you have favorite matrix? poverty rates, unemployment rates, high school graduation rates, neighborhood segregation indices, etc. And then there's a second question from uh, Taani Shu. Uh, thank you both for your extremely informative talks. I have a perhaps far-fetched question about the potential link between immigrant workers and the disadvantaged people who are currently exposed to COVID-19. I see that uh, mobility has become a problem in both cases. The frontline workers are seen to spread the disease because they do not stay at home. The same way that immigrants who seek job opportunities are expected to go back where they come from. On the other side, we may, we may also notice a parallel between the contagious mobility of capitalism and pandemics. I wonder how we might consider not only the content, but also the form of this current criticism on mobility. So, um, Jamila, would you like to take one or the other or both? Yeah, uh, these questions are really wonderful. So I guess to the first question I would say, um, I, 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 I sort of sympathize with the question in many ways, because I always hope that I'll find a metric that is my favorite metric. But instead, and maybe this is just the curse of like being a social scientist, when I read this question, each of these metrics, the, the first thing I think about is how much of a problem they are, right? So I teach an undergrad lecture course on um, the politics of poverty, and we spend two weeks talking about how problematic uh, the, the poverty rate is as a measure, um, and what it doesn't tell us, and what it obscures, and the assumptions embedded in it um, that are in part, in, in, indeed part of the problem. Um, Similarly with unemployment rates and, and probably all of these. And so I guess what I would say is one of the reasons why I'm so drawn to qualitative research in addition to quantitative research is precisely because of my dissatisfaction with, these, with all of these metrics. And it's not to say the metrics aren't important. I obviously use them all the time in helping to motivate and contextualize and explain the problems that I study. Um, but I always use them with a bit of trepidation and hesitance, precisely because they often reveal as much, um, if not, uh, or, or as much as they obscure. Um, and then I can stop there or I can address the next question, whatever. Okay, so this next question, I, I love that it's uh, described as far-fetched. If, if these are the far-fetched questions that you have, participants, please ask far-fetched questions, um, because it, it's so thoughtful. This is a parallel I would not have um, thought of had I been left to my own devices. So thankfully, I haven't been left to my own devices and we have people engaging. You know, one of the things that I think is really interesting about uh, both the case of kind of immigrant workers and other kinds of disadvantaged workers, um, you know, they're, they're mobile because they have to be, right? Not by choice. Uh, my, my brother uh, drives Uber in New York City. He, that's what he did full time um, as a profession before this. And uh, around mid-March, he stopped uh, largely be, because I begged him to on a consistent uh, basis. Uh, and yesterday he started to drive again. Um, and, you know, I, I called him at the end of the day and, and I just feel so fearful for him. And he is very fearful as well. And he's not driving because he wants to, right? 
but because he feels he has to. Part of that is a function of kind of economic necessity. Who is going to pay my bills? Another part of that is actually institutional, right? Uber has a rule that says any driver that goes more than X amount of time without driving can, can be cut, right? Or deprioritized. And so for both reasons, he's out there, but various kinds of disadvantaged workers and immigrants, right? My parents are both immigrants, are, are mobile because they have to be, right? Um, but then in many ways, as a result, they're both um, exposed because of that mobility and, uh, and therefore more vulnerable and disciplined because of that mobility, told that they do not belong, that they're taking jobs from those who, who deserve jobs, et cetera. And then on the other side of your question, this is what makes the parallel so powerful, is capital, right? Which is mobile, but not necessarily because it has to be, right? But because it wants to be, um, and it's weird to sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of, uh, capital is not a thing, right? It's, it, I don't want to personify it too much. Um, but in addition to being mobile, um, but for very different reasons, uh, capital is, is also not as disciplined, right? In the same way that we tell immigrants, you don't belong here, go back to where you came from, or that we tell frontline workers, you do belong on the front lines because I need to be able to hop in an Uber anytime I want to. We discipline those workers. Um, are, are, they're disciplined by the state and by the structures and institutions that the state um, either allows or enables. Um, and so the, the, the contrast here is really striking. On the one side, the sort of marginal side, you have workers who are both disciplined and mobile because of necessity. On the other side, you have capital that's mobile for the purposes of the accumulation of wealth and privilege, not out of necessity, and that is hardly disciplined, right? Um, and I just think that I don't have anything to say about that besides that that parallel is really striking to me. Yeah, I mean, needless to say, I don't have uh, favorite metrics. Um, I don't work on the present. Again, yeah, I would just say the job of STS scholars is to attack everybody else's metrics. So um, the one thing, I, again, I can't add much, I think, to Jamila's superb answer on that second question, except maybe a kind of part of the language that uh, we might need there is the opposition between what's seen as a legitimate state-sanctioned mobility and a not legitimate non-state-sanctioned mobility. So I think, for example, for the 18th century, masses, of course, of laws about vagrancy, about homelessness, disciplining constantly people being out of place, while then, of course, supporting and putting a massive apparatus behind soldiers and other people going around the world, uh, where they also get ill. It's worth noting. I mean, you, you can and people do think of seasoning as the price that one pays for leaving one's home, right? That difference is exactly what the body is paying for. But that's a kind of legal and legitimate mobility and is very much contrasted to say any slave who wanders off a property to which they belong. And I think maybe us keeping in mind uh, state sanctioned mobility, let's support truckers who need to drive across roads and so on and so forth. That's perfectly legitimate mobility against the constant kind of disciplining of other people crossing borders. Uh, in spreading disease in the same way, of course, it's the same process, but some are allowed and some aren't. Okay, uh, the next question is for uh, Jamila from Jason. Uh, thank you both for your talks. I'm really struck by Suman's comments about changing the state. I was wondering, Jamila, have you encountered in your research on either the pandemic or on Medicaid examples of those living in poverty turning to or creating non-state autonomous social formations, such as mutual aid institutions, that arise to meet gaps in healthcare, or other strategies for meeting healthcare needs in the absence of governments? Oh, this is such a great question. Um, you know, I have to say, part of, and I didn't mention this early because I didn't want to spend too much time on the book, but, but part of what I think of 
think about and spend quite a bit of time on in the book is trying to understand how the experiences that people um, who rely on programs like Medicaid, for example, how those experiences actually shape uh, their political lives, right? So their, your actual ability to, in, to engage and exert agency in precisely the ways that this uh, question suggests uh, is itself tied up in your experiences with the state. And I say that to say that this is, that I love the question because it sort of points to what it means to change the state and it points to sort of agency in the face of a powerful state. Um, but I also will say that like it, you, the state itself is, is, is bound up in, in the process of being able to exert this kind of agency. And that's part of, of what the book uh, points out. I will say, so there are some examples, often the, the examples um, that come to mind the most for me are actually examples not of people creating sort of mutual aid institutions or other institutions that are meant to provide for needs in the absence of the government. That's actually very rare. Um, and I can't think of an example of that off the top of my head. What I can think of a lot of examples of is people um, engaging together politically and coming together um, to create social formations meant to put pressure on, put demands on, and, um, and influence the government so that more of the resources that the government has uh, to distribute are distributed um, you know, in the direction of those community of, you know, of, of disadvantaged uh, populations and communities. But I think that the question actually points to, uh, to, to makes me think about the absence of these kinds of formations that the question indicates, um, and the reasons for the absence of those kinds of formations, uh, the difficulty of imagining for people who are in otherwise, um, you know, in situations of deprivation, with respect to material resources, the difficulty of imagining solutions to that problem outside of the purview of the government, right? And it's not to say that people um, don't do that. It's just to say that it's it's difficult, and and I think therefore uh, less common, at least in my in my experience. Were there more questions or Suman or? I don't think I can respond to that one. I think there are more questions. God, there yeah. are a lot. Yeah, there are more questions. <laughs> Quad, are you there? Are you frozen? Oh. Uh, microphone, un un unmute yourself, Fuad. You want me to continue? OK. Uh, so the next question from uh, Jocelyn uh, is for both of you. And starting with Professor Michener, I'm wondering, would you conceptualize between individuality and collectives within institutionally embedded inequalities? For Professor Seth, is seasoning possibly a spectrum between individualized and collective processes of inter, inter realizations? I think that's what you mean. Uh, systems of both. Thank you for that. And then there's a question from John a bit provocatively asking you, uh, thanking you for the talks, uh, has a stronger belief in civil liberties weakened the West's response to the virus? Okay, maybe I'll start, I'll, I'll start with John and, and work up to Jocelyn. I would say yes. <laughs> um, and I've thought a lot more in the last several weeks about, um, about, uh, the sort of American attachment to a particular vision of freedom um, and a particular uh, enactment of the liberty and how it's really come to the fore in this moment, the ways that that can be uh, destructive and the ways that it is indeed a, a privilege to, um, a, a function of sort of privilege and advantage uh, to be able to, uh, to claim like liberties in the face of, you know, those liberties potentially meaning death for others and usually others, right? Not just, not you, but usually people who are very different from you 
um, and who for that reason perhaps are devalued. But the short answer is I would say yes. Um, to Jocelyn's question, I think this is great. I mean, I think part of, part of my own emphasis on uh, institutions is uh, a kind of perhaps too subtle pushback against what I see as um, a kind of typical explanation for inequalities as being rooted in kind of individual choices and behaviors. Um, that's one of the reasons why even as I presented that data on health inequalities, I sort of included that caveat that um, these are not really an explanation and, and they've been sort of deployed as an explanation in, in the kind of discourse that has emerged around COVID-19. Um, and that has, that has happened to the tune of, well, people have higher rates of diabetes and obesity and asthma and all of these other diseases that are a function of ostensibly lifestyle um, or choices. And that's a very sort of individualized approach to thinking about uh, these inequalities, even when the Surgeon General um, you know, spoke kind of directly to ostensibly um, you know, African American and Latino populations and said, do it for your big mama, do it for your abuela, all of these other stereotypes. And at the same time said, stop drinking, stop smoking, stop doing drugs. And underlying that was the idea that uh, part of the reason for, 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 for you, for these groups kind of um, heightened exposure and vulnerability to the virus is because of their own behavior and activities. And so because that discourse is so prevalent and it's so readily available and, and frankly easy and comfortable, it's much more uh, just palatable to people to imagine that we could change our individual behaviors and it could make some of these things okay. Um, because of that, I sort of tend to emphasize um, uh, institutions and kind of, uh, and 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 uh, it, with respect to like, you know, um, yeah, I tend to emphasize institutions. And one of the things that I think happens when you emphasize institutions is that there's a kind of um, collective responsibility implicated there. And I think that that makes people uncomfortable. If this is about institutional racism or um, institutional bias that has to do with uh, social class or what have you, uh, then then more of us are, um, whether we mean to or not, p potentially benefiting from this or perpetuating it or implicated in it. And so um, I think that a collective is implicated uh, when you sort of highlight and foreground institutions in a way that isn't the case when explanations of inequalities are individualized. Um, so I'll, I'll go in the same order. Um, all right, look, again, I don't work on the present, um, but I would actually go in the opposite direction to Jamila on this question about the stronger belief in civil liberties while deferring to her expertise only on the grounds that it's all of the communities within the US who have the least civil liberties who are doing the worst. So the idea that more civil liberties is the problem rather than less civil liberties doesn't seem to make sense to me. Look at the poor, look at African-American communities and look at prisoners, all of whom are systematically deprived of their civil liberties and are doing terribly. So I guess, I mean, I think we can both, basically we're on the same page here, but I think what we should do is begin by either saying the West's so-called civil liberties or at least put those in inverted commas. It's like, you know, Gandhi getting asked what he thought of Western civilization and replying that he thought it would be a good idea. Um, I think that I'm not sure that I want to buy this line about the West civil liberties when it's a very selective group of civil liberties being applied to people who are then the ones complaining that they're civil liberties when they're the freest members are the ones being impugned. So that would be my start on that. And then the question about individuals and collectives, I'll go in a somewhat different uh, direction here. So for seasoning, seasoning was absolutely an individualized thing. Uh, think of it actually, the kind of 19th century cognate, but 
I won't bore you with why it's not exactly the same, but the language is acclimatization. So you go to Denver and you're up really high and it takes you three days before you can go for a run because you have to become acclimated. So it's an individualized process located in the body, right? But what's super interesting is that you then come part of a class of people. You are then a group that is seasoned. So one of the things that I'm super interested in, again, it's the horror coming from the past is, what happens when we have a large enough group of people who are now having had the disease, hopefully now immune to a second batch, will we start conceptualizing of those people as a group that will then be sent in to do particularly dangerous kinds of tasks? Because that's of course what was done in the past. So that collectivization of the now immune is something that we should probably uh, start thinking about and start worrying about. Because again, I suspect that the collectively immune who will get sent in will be the people who have the fewest civil liberties. Think of prisoners who now have immunity and the kinds of tasks that they are going to be sent to do that they cannot say no to. Shall I, shall I go, go on, Gwed? Yes, I think I, yeah. right. <laughs> So the questions are proliferating. We said we go to 2.30. I think that'll probably accommodate the rest of these questions, but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where it goes. I have noted, as most of you probably also have, that Zoom things seem to have no, because there's no spent spatial barriers, it feels like there's no temporal ones either. All right, so let me, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll read two questions. That, that these are pretty intense and quite different. And as Jamila says, you know, they're, they, um, they're interdisciplinary. So maybe two is enough. So from Eric uh, Chaffetz, Dr. Peter Dajak has noted that one of the causes of COVID-19 and of the viruses which are transmitted by animals um, is to land, ascribe this to land use change. People moving into new areas, encroachment into wildlife habitat, building roads into a forest or a mine logging camp. There are many, many examples of diseases like Ebola, SARS, and others, HIV itself, um, it, like this. And, and, and that's a global trend that will drive the rise of future pandemics. And so this is a quote. Comment on the relation of viruses to capitalism, particularly capitalism's relation to climate collapse. All right, so that's that one. And uh, from Davina Kawuma, thank you for thanking you for the presentations. Um, she is curious about your both presenters' thoughts on the separation between the human world of politics and the non-human and apparently apolitical sphere of the natural animal world. All right, those are the two questions. Okay, um, really different and also uh, thought-provoking and I think challenging questions. So I hadn't heard of this argument about the relationship between viruses and land use change, uh, although it doesn't strike me as, uh, uh, as terribly surprising. Um, it's also sort of out of the sphere of my media expertise, so I don't know how to sort of evaluate uh, the claim. Irrespective of that, I think that the sort of invitation to think about the relationship between viruses and capitalism um, and specifically through the lens of climate collapse is a, is a welcome invitation um, to sort of engage a really important set of questions. Uh, I, I thought a, a bit about this with respect to the kind of initial, the news after the initial few weeks of the lockdown that we had seen almost immediate improvements in a variety of environmental outcomes, right? That suddenly rivers and lakes that were, you know, um, you know, that were uh, overwhelmed with pollution before were now becoming clear and we were seeing, you know, dolphins in the Venice Canal or what have you, so on and so forth. Uh, and I was sort of struck by how uh, immediate um, the, the kind of positive uh, uh, effects on the environment were to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to our containment and specifically to what I think of as the kind of containment um, of capitalism, however, temporary. And I had an interesting conversation with, uh, with my six-year-old, he was six at the time, he's had a birthday since his COVID birthday. Um, and, and he said to me, 
oh, if the environment is doing better, mommy, then we know what, that this is probably a good idea. Why don't we just have once a, one month out of the year or two months out of the year where everyone stops and doesn't do anything and it's good for the environment and families get to spend more time together and everybody will be happy. And I thought, wow, youthful innocence. <laughs> and, and, but he really th wanted to know, well, why couldn't we do this, you know? And I was trying to think of a way to say, you know, in a, a way that was appropriate for a six-year-old, that's completely unrealistic. Uh, but then I was challenged, why is that completely unrealistic? And I kept coming back to this capitalism, right? Which in many ways requires constant growth, constantly increasing consumption. And the growth and consumption um, almost need to be indifferent to their consequences. And the climate, uh, uh, climate change, the environment um, are collateral consequences of the sort of bottomless pursuit of economic growth um, that's necessitated by capitalism. And so I think if anything, um, the, the kind of tension between what's good for the environment and what's good for the economy, uh, which I think can be a, a, a false dichotomy, depending on sort of how the, the kind of frame that you bring to it. But if you bring a market capitalist frame to it, then I think it can feel like a legitimate dichotomy and a legitimate choice. And so long as those things um, are perceived that way, then we are in trouble. And I think that this pandemic has shown that that is the, the way that the choice is perceived at present, at, at, at base in the United States, but I would say even beyond that. So I'll stop there and I'll, I'll give the floor to Simone. Uh, don't give the floor to me because I have no expertise on this. My only suggestion is that that question should be the topic for one of the next ICM things. I think it would be superb to get environmental history, the history of capitalism and the history of disease globally together to work through that question. Um, and I'll just note, given the question after it, that of course Eric's uh, question is in a sense a partial answer to that next question about the separation of the human world of politics and the non-human and apparently a political world of uh, the non-human, that environmental history uh, gives us a way to, of course, problematize that split. So too does STS. Um, I would just throw out, lots of you have probably read it, but Tim Mitchell's Can the Mosquito Speak is a nice little way to combine a lot of these kinds of questions and that question of how to write narratives that don't necessarily give agency to the non-human. I don't really have a stake in that. Um, but do make clear that it's not just humans that are involved in this whole process. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would, I think to that second question, I would do the same thing, which is sort of point back to Eric's question um, and the kind of connections to some of what I said, even with respect to uh, the idea that when, when humans are contained, when we're stopped, even for a week, even for a few weeks, even for a few months, that the non-human world thrives, right? Um, and, and in the context of seeing that, literally seeing that happen in real time, um, it makes it really difficult not to sort of face up to um, the role that, that humans are playing in, in, in shaping and in many ways destroying uh, the non-human world. That this idea of the non-human world as apparently apolitical is one I have to think about more. I guess I don't have an immediate stake in it, but, um, but but I guess I'm, I'm suspicious and there are red flags that go up anytime anything is described as apolitical. <laughs> um, maybe that's because I'm a political scientist and maybe that's just because I'm cynical. Uh, but there's certainly uh, my, my natural impetus is to think that everything is political. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, these, are, these are wonderful uh, responses, really uh, intense and very interesting questions. Yeah, I think this question of capitalism and the virus, 
that's a great suggestion, Suman. We were thinking that our next webinar, I don't know when we're quite going to have the energy to convene it, would be on, uh, have to do with economics. And so that, that, that just seems perfect. But the idea of bringing in, you know, uh, history of medicine, environmental history, as well as economics, that, that just, that's uh, really important. It's very difficult. We all feel there's a fundamental connection, but it's difficult uh, to, to, to sort of uh, rigorously lay it out just on that. So thank you for those questions They're They're amazing and there's ever more of them. So let me uh, read out two more. And I'm not really sure again, speaking aloud here during this first time we're in this format, if it's necessary to actually read them aloud, but I think it allows us time to think about it. But would, do you think, would you rather just be answering them because you too can read them, right? You see what I mean? You find it useful, or would it be easier for you guys to just say, "Oh, I'll take Xavier's question, or I'll take Samuel's question"? Or I think it's useful. It, I also, um, yeah, just in case okay. some people are visually impaired and so on, it'll be useful. Okay, so I'll keep doing it. So here's a question from um, Samuel Perez: We see a, a big problem in how the pandemics affects productive processes in the global south. Particularly, many labor-intensive firms want to open their production, putting at risk thousands of people who are on uh, living wages. What are your thoughts about how to approach the economic inequalities and the need to quote, open the economy, unquote, in the midst of COVID-19? So that Samuel's question, Xavier, on the one hand, the virus impacts black and impoverished communities the hardest. On the other hand, there seems to be an overlap between white nationalism and opposition to lockdowns. The mostly white protesters who took to the streets to demand a reopening of the economy have brandished racist signs like Confederate flags and anti-Asian slogans. Republican governors have also been reluctant to implement lockdowns. Do you think that there's a link between these two phenomena? As COVID-19 is increasingly seen as a black and poor people disease, quote unquote, the racist people who see black lives as expendable might lose any, quote, empathy for the victims of the disease. I'm going to jump in quickly to answer that second one. This is what I'm worried about. The racial essentialization of the kinds of health disparities that we're seeing is, I think, exactly where white nationalists are going. Whereas the rest of us would say things like, yeah, if you're poor and constantly uh, screwed by a political system, then diseases hit you harder. That's wiped out by uh, black people are more susceptible to this disease, so white people don't need to mark, worry about it. And indeed, this is a marker of white superiority. So it's exactly that biological essentialism about that argument, which I think is growing, uh, that is the problem and why we actually need to work very hard. And people, not me, but like people with scientific training in this, need to do studies to split apart uh, the biological elements and the socioeconomic and political elements. Um, yeah, I can't answer the first one. That is 100% Jamila. So. <laughs> so I'll start with Xavier's question and, um, and just sort of uh, reinforce what Suman said, which I fully agree with. Uh, and I thought about this a lot. So as soon as, as, soon as the virus started to be covered um, widely, I would, every morning, I would Google race coronavirus just to see what was coming up because I was really interested in how this was going to um, emerge uh, in the public discourse. And, um, and at one point, I was early on, I was sort of lamenting that there didn't appear to be anything and saying, well, where's the data broken down uh, by racial subgroups? I know this is having a disproportionate impact. Why aren't we hearing anything about it? And, and my partner said to me, that might be a good thing. And I was somewhat annoyed at him at the time. And he, but he said, think about it. I mean, there probably are racial disproportionalities, but to the extent that that comes to the fore, it may make white people feel like this is a people of color disease and that might actually blunt the appropriate responses to it. And I was uh, like a bit astonished that I hadn't thought of that. I thought, oh, I thought I was the most possibly cynical person, but apparently I partnered with someone who's even more cynical than I am. Um, and then, you know, it, in many ways, it, it, it feels like it came to fruition, right? That there was a turning point in discourse around the coronavirus where the, the conversation around racial disparities um, really developed and grew. And it, 
it appears, I mean, I don't know. You, I mean, it's very hard to tell like whether these things are simply co-varying and moving together, um, but driven by like the same underlying factors or different underlying factors or whether they're actually, um, there's some kind of relationship between the two. Uh, my hunch is to think that there is, um, but I actually think the mechanism is experiential, right? So while I do think there are sort of white nationalists who are explicitly thinking, this thing is killing black people, so who cares? Their lives are expendable. Uh, I, want, I want my hair cut, right? Uh, I wouldn't say that I don't believe that those people are out there, I, I absolutely do. Um, but I don't think that you need that mechanism. I think that, for example, geographic differences overlaid here, where a lot of people in cities who are most vulnerable are also disproportionately people of color. And people in rural counties, for example, many of many counties where you've only seen a handful of cases, those people are, are not exclusively, but are disproportionately white. And they're looking around and it doesn't feel like that big of a deal to them. Um, which is a very different feeling than people who live in quote unquote inner city neighborhoods. So through the mechanism of experience, without any sort of explicit racial animus, this is precisely the dynamic that can emerge. Your experience tells you this isn't a big deal. You want your hair cut and your nails done versus your experience tells you that this is lethal because my family is in Queens, New York. Look, the neighbors have coronavirus. The people across the street have coronavirus. The people around the corner have coronavirus. They're not going anywhere. They're afraid. They want everything shut down for as long as possible. And it's not because they're thinking, this is hurting Black people. We need to respond to it. It's because they can feel the pain that it's causing in their immediate environment in a way that uh, many white people, because of uh, the, the insulation that they get from, from economic, um, both from economic kind of advantage, but then also uh, even low income white people who may live in less dense, more rural areas who are not feeling the pain of this as much either. And so there are multiple mechanisms. It can be through explicit racial animus and a kind of um, purposeful devaluing of black lives and, and brown lives, but it can also be through your own experience that tells you very different things. And that's a deeper institutional cause, right? The fact that people of color have such fundamentally different experiences in this country means that even when we're experiencing the same threat, we are experiencing it in different ways. And so we can't respond together in a way that's sensible and that meets the threat appropriately. Okay, um, with three more questions, uh, which we probably should take, Natalie, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, wait, wait, I would suggest actually we are running out of time. And, and to take just one of them is actually kind of a, a really interesting comment that, that brings the, the question of, of migrants and, and movements of populations and capital into okay. Latin. I, I, but I, I, maybe just as a way of closing, um, to talk about one that, that opens up a question of optimism. <laughs> I'm kind of curious about that. We're talking about cynicism, I think the analysis here, which, and, and I have to just say just for personally, there's just been something very invigorating about this discussion in terms of trying to get an intellectual handle on something that we're also involved with, of course, in a day-to-day -day way involving a lot of fear and, and, uh, and all of that. So this has just been fantastic. So I'm thanking you ahead of time. So Jacqueline Ho, I'm gonna, I think we should just end with this question. And, and perhaps you can both answer it. I'm gonna broaden it out a little bit and think about it in terms of perhaps even historically taking historical perspective. Are there any grounds for op optimism, right? Um, so, uh, so are, are you nonetheless optimistic that this crisis will call more attention to the social determinants of health and the need for institutional change? Before you answer, just make this, since we're closing up, make a couple of comments in response to uh, uh, the questions, earlier questions. Okay. So one in relationship to the issue of civil liberties that were raised. I think this has become a very important question now because there's a lot of comparison being made with the response of the Chinese states, which is seen as much more effective uh, in relationship to what's been happening in the US. And I think that kind of decenters it from thinking about the ways in which in neoliberal America, you know, the safety net has been shredded. There's enormous inequality of access to basic healthcare, medicine, 
and so on. And I think, you know, it makes it, it kind of plays into a populist discourse that the problem is civil liberties rather than the basic access and inequalities of health that I think, Jamila, you've done a lot of very wonderful work on. And the other one, another very brief comment, uh, really thinking about Eric's question earlier and uh, Suman, your, in, your own 18th century period. I know Eric has long been interested in this question of enclosures, displacement of the enclosed to the new world, the massive land grabbing that has happened in, in, in the new world, and the diseases that accompanied this process, right? So there is a way in which that too, that period too, is of uh, crucial importance for us to think about when we're thinking of these pandemics. Sorry to take the time, but we'll leave it open to you now. That's great. No, no, I think that's, I'm glad that you took the time, <laughs> but uh, those are great ideas. So uh, uh, optimism is not my forte. I will um, acknowledge that, but I will say that the moments that I have felt somewhat optimistic uh, in the midst of this have been when I've talked to students uh, who are now rethinking their future, who are rethinking their priorities, and rethinking what is important to them in the, what, in the wake of this crisis. And a lot of that is as a result of a kind of real time, real life, concrete, urgent exposure to inequalities and to ideas like ideas around social inequity and social determinants of health, et cetera. And so the number of students I've seen in the last few weeks who say, forget what I was thinking before, I have to do public health, or forget what I was thinking before, I have to study you know, inequality, or I have to, I have to find the way to intervene, uh, such that when this happens in my children's lifetime, it doesn't result in the same um, outcomes. So my optimism, if anything, is in is in uh, people uh, being exposed to ideas that might change their course going forward. But I will say, just because we're paying attention to social determinants or to inequity, uh, it doesn't mean that that will result in positive change. It depends on, on the framing of that discourse. It depends on what's done with that information. And a lot of that actually depends on the kinds of institutional and structural uh, responses and factors that I've talked about throughout today. And so I wouldn't want us to take for granted that because we're more aware of these things, that change is on the horizon. And instead, I would want us to sort of uh, take uh, the bull by the horn, so to speak, and think about what we can actively be doing to make such change uh, more rather than less likely. And that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. I don't know that I can top that. And in fact, I agree with that 100%. So if you split my personality into someone as researcher and someone as teacher, someone as researcher is almost always pessimistic. Someone as teacher, it's the reason that I get up in the morning and the reason that I have optimism is because uh, the students that we teach, there is always hope to be found there and hope that they will do things better. So I agree with you wholeheartedly, Jamila. And then, yeah. <laughs> I agree with you too about the second part, which is that crises like these, if I were to, to you know, go with my historical sensibility, crises like these are more likely to get worse than they are to get better, but there's a chance that they'll get better if all of us can intervene and have everything go the right way. And that's the reason to keep the fight going that there's a chance that we can actually get something much better about this, a small one, but a chance, and that's what we have to fight for. So on that resounding note, <laughs> that's, it's great. Uh, there's much more to talk about, of course, right? But I think we're coming to the end of this webinar. We're actually a few minutes past it. And so I'll just take this occasion once again to thank you deeply and uh, enthusiastically and infusively for your generous and extremely intelligent, eloquent, articulate uh, uh, engagement with these questions. Thank you very much to Suman Saif and Jamila Misner. I really hope we can see you again soon, hopefully in person, and if not, uh, virtually. So thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. And with that, we'll bid you all farewell. Thank you all for, for joining us. It's, it's, it's really uh, wonderful to see this many people willing to put the time into this on this lovely afternoon.
and um, hoping that you'll join us again soon. And for those whose questions we didn't get to get to, I'm very sorry about that. Um, hold on to them, ask them another time. One final note is we are recording this webinar and so I believe it should be available. We, we, this is our first one, so I don't quite know the mechanisms, but on the, it, it should be available uh, hopefully on the ICM website and perhaps we'll send an email about that for people who didn't have a chance to join. I believe there's actually several other webinars happening at exactly the same time, which is unfortunate, but, but there you have it. So with that, goodbye. Thank you very much again. It's delightful to, to host you. And thank you from me as well. Thanks very much. <laughs>